I want to bring that passion to that that God inspired in me when I was there. I want to bring it home, and I want to show people that we can dream bigger. We can do something bigger. We can leave a mark in history as well. Hi, everybody. I am Rox De Leon, and this is episode seven of A Curious Character. This episode is a conversation with Paul Seralde. Paul and I chat about why he studied material science and engineering and how he got to attend UC Berkeley for his master's. We also recall the perspectives and new skills he brought back to the Philippines after he graduated. Hi Paul, welcome hey, to the show. Hi Rox, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'd like to start this conversation by asking you why you studied engineering. So, Paul, what's your story? I guess, I mean, the thing that would pop to my mind is I went to something that I enjoy a lot. I love um, doing math. I love solving problems. I love science as well. And it's not because I hate myself. I, I mean, it's not because it's hard, meaning that I hate myself, but... It, it naturally comes easy to me as well. So my mind, there are intuitions that are some people would fi- find hard to get that just comes naturally to me. So that's how I got uh, attracted into engineering and into uh, in the entire field. Um, and yeah, yeah. Back when I was a kid, um, I would play with my father uh, building Lego blocks. So even as a youngster, I see myself um, building and making stuff. And luckily I was able to to continue having my, uh, I mean, continue pursuing my passion as I grew old, because I know a lot of people now, they would say back then when they were a kid as well, they, they're curious, they love science, and yeah. then they just, <laughs> along the way, they would get roadblocks because big lang my calculus now and those kind of stuff. But luckily for me, and that's why I'm always grateful to be in the position of where I am right now, because I love doing what I love. So Yeah. And, Talk to us a bit about the decision process in high school. So was it like, was it non-negotiable? You just knew, yeah, I'm going to do engineering. And then how did you end up yeah. in Ateneo? So I would say it is it would, it is non-negotiable by contract even. Because uh, I, I, I went to uh, Philippine Science High School during my high school. So And uh, as a graduate in the system, we are required to take SMT degrees for college. Not that a lot, not that everyone follows it, because <laughs> a lot of people don't. Because obviously you can't really gauge. But yeah, anyway. Um, so I went to Philippine Science High School. That, that's why I am compelled to to take a science course, although I I wouldn't have taken it any other way. Anyway, I mean, science and engineering is is my only way to go. I would say. So yeah, and uh, why uh, material science? Yeah, I was gonna Engineering, say. Yeah. <laughs> so I, obviously, for me, it's a tight, uh, tight race between Ateneo de Manila and UP Diliman. And in UP Diliman, I took uh, molecular biology and chemical engineering. Okay. And uh, I, I, I took MBB. I took MBB. MBB, because it was, interesting. Yeah, they, they have a high quota. They say. And I was aiming for for an oblation scholarship. Um, just a ba- brief background as well. I've been chasing scholarships since I was in high school. Because why pay for education when you can have it free, right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I and then in Ateneo, uh, I took. I wasn't even sure what my course was. To be honest, like when I got the decision, I was surprised. Now, oh, applied physics, material science, calling in a plan. But to, to answer your question, I took MSE because it, it's not that deep. It's just, it sounded very cool. Applied physics, <laughs> material science, engineering. It's like the course, the course title itself is long and sounded technical, geeky. But also, I guess I'm quite inspired with, with materials. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a very heavy uh, automotive guy, but I back then I saw myself working in the industry, creating next generation materials for automotives or for rockets and um, all this uh, kind of material. Um, I'm, I'm the Iron Man type of guy. Like if you ask me who's, who's my favorite superhero, it's either Iron Man, Batman, or Spider-Man with the technology. 
technology technology driven spider man hindi yung yung spider bit so now it's Elon yeah, Musk because I I would see technology yeah obviously yeah <laughs> now it would be I mean Elon Musk is a, is a huge inspiration for me and it's a huge figure um but there's a lot of people how's the undergrad experience lived up to your expectation of what you were expecting <laughs> yeah i mean when so before i started college i was expecting a lot you know very motivated and um um you're very excited to start your dream basically but then when you get into it into the nitty gritty of it you just think about survival like <laughs> some part of my dreams died because i was just thinking about how to get by passing uh this terror prof how do i offset my c or c minus to still get a b plus and all those stuff but i would say my, uh, generally my undergrad experience is in terms of social and the formative years i mean it's still there like it didn't kill my passion for science and engineering and it even brought me opportunities Like you said, um, we're, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be talking about the graduate, graduate, uh, my graduate studies years. But mm-hmm. uh, being at school, being in the university is a huge factor why I got there. Just doing exciting stuff. I mean, you have to be realistic with that. Like, especially with the current resources that we have. I mean, we're getting there. But back in when I was in college, there's it's not that exciting. Um, we're still doing lab works. We're still doing like hard science physical science and not much of the engineering side of things but i think we've progressed quite quite well and it's very true what you said about mm-hmm. us in the philippines having very limited resources so if you still remember yeah. how yeah. you maximize your resources back then how did you make the most out of your undergrad experience okay. yeah I mean, I'm gonna answer this quite, um, like frankly. Uh, my first per- four years in Ateneo, I was just looking to graduate with a good grades, with good grades, and get employed in local industry. Because I was naive, like I didn't. I was thinking that since I'm coming from Ateneo, that people would be chasing for me after graduating. But then I realized there's actually not much of an industry for me that would chase me. Here in the Philippines, so that's one huge problem that we're, we, me, that I am trying to address as well personally uh, with my future endeavors. Um, so that's it. My first four years, I didn't do much. Like I didn't join a lot. I didn't maximize, as to use your term, my resources and my network in college. I was just really doing my thing, trying to be a good student and getting good grades, because I was just like dreaming for this kind of life. But then for my fifth year, that's when I got exposed to, obviously you're gonna be, you're thinking about your future now. You're not just thinking about survival, you're thinking about what you will be doing after graduating. And that's when I started exploring all these opportunities. Like I started joining competitions, I started joining organizations. We even built a sort of like a very early stage startup with my friend during my fifth year in college. And um, yeah, I would just, I just wanted to, I, you don't know her, but uh, his name is Earl Forlales. He's my undergrad close friend, and he's the co-founder of Kubo now. Wow. But I would say, I, I mean, I'm not the usual guy who would just blurt out names, but I think he deserves this because without him, I would say I wouldn't be exposed to the kind of life that I am having right now, which is entrepreneurship, tech, techpreneurship, and just the startup world. So yeah, we, we even had the phase now we we... I joined him in his apartment to start ideating wow. with the, yeah, I, I lived there for like two months to start ideating with stuff, like thinking about our future, which is non-dependent with the industry. Like if we, we believe that if we don't have the industry to get us the jobs, then we build the industry for other future um, people like us to get the job. But yeah, so that's it. But I would say As, a, an, as an undergrad, I would just suggest that be open to opportunities. Never think about, this is bad maybe, but never think about the consequences of what you're doing, especially if you're, you're not, I'm not saying drink, drink every night or all those stuff, right? But a lot of college students do that without thinking of the consequences. And I think if you have the same energy with, just, with your career, like just trying out stuff, not thinking about 
what if I fail? What if this? What if that? It doesn't matter. Just, just, just do it. Just try and join clubs, move out of your comfort zone, and think of the bigger picture. Yeah, that's my my biggest. Yeah. Well said. Very well said. And given that, so it, it seems like <laughs> when you realize that oh, there is not a lot of opportunity waiting for me outside of academia. At what point did you realize that you yeah. wanted to apply for Berkeley or for graduate school if you applied to more than just Berkeley? So um, this is quite a story because uh, we have a TO class uh, and we have an activity there where our prof would ask us, give us three things that are not negotiable for you after you graduate. So this is during our senior year. So that's one of the things that I said. Uh, I wanted to do grad studies abroad to gain expertise and network and skills and bring it back here to the Philippines to help build the country. But I wasn't sure what school then. So it's just me. It's just an idea for me. It's just something that keeps me going. And then it started to become concrete when we when I actually had the opportunity to go to the U.S. Um, during my fifth year, we presented our paper on uh, the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco, right, yeah. and that was around Christmas time. Yeah, I mean, I'm I had the privilege to have some relatives there that would be able to drive me around different campuses, and they were very supportive in ter supportive in terms of and, in and encouraging me to to try out schools uh, in the U.S. So we went around, and one of the campuses that we went to was UC Berkeley, which, um, quite frankly, I did not fall in love at first sight. <laughs> I mean, I was, I mean, we expected, we expected a lot from uh, university, universities in the first world, especially in top universities in the U.S., but it just humbled me to see that it's, it's not very far from where we are in terms of, uh, I mean, just the buildings, just how it is, like, you're expecting flying cars, you're expecting robots everywhere yeah. for the best tech co uh, university in the world, but it's not like that. It's still human driven. It's still... All of these are just um, fruits of ideas of people. So that's the, the good part of it. And then, yeah, I mean, so luckily we went to the material science and engineering department and we bumped into the dean. And that's the nice time. building. I had a good time. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's it was a nice it, building. Yeah, it the was prettiest bird. <laughs> it was one of the nicest buildings in, in campus, aside from the new ones. This one is really old, but it's really, yeah, it's like you said, it's like it feels historical. So anyway, I was talking to him and we were asking about, you know, our chances, my chances as a Filipino coming from a developing country, going into a university like that. And to be honest, he was quite optimistic. Like he told me there are actually a lot of Filipinos here. Um, the Filipino community is quite represented, represented in the campus. And that for me, that one is big because what, what it's telling me is that it's possible for people like me to 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 get access to all these um, facilities and to to just get admitted to this wonderful school. So I wanted to apply to Berkeley because it was one of the campuses that I went to, and obviously it's a great engineering school. And yeah, did you go to Stanford during your stay in the Bay? Oh yeah, yeah, I went to Stanford. I mean, Stanford would be I love Stanford. What was your impression <laughs> the first time was, you got there? Yeah, it was. I mean, Stanford would be a campus with a wow factor for me. Like, yeah, this is, it's really nice. It's, it's like Ateneo with steroids. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's so cool. I mean, it's, it's not as open as Berkeley, but it's really huge as well. And yeah, it's just, yeah, it's nice. Stanford is nice. I, I applied to Stanford as well, just full yeah. disclaimer. Yeah. So I applied, but basically I didn't apply because of the campus. I just applied for the opportunities of like being of, for engineering, basically. Like I wanted the best that can I can get, that I can get because that's what aligns with my mission, right? I mean, if I wanted to bring the best here in the Philippines, then I would, I would sh and should come from one of the best as well. So for Stanford, did you apply yeah. for a master's or a PhD? Oh, no, I did. I mean... I did. I applied for a straight PhD, which is I don't. Wow. Which is, I, I, I mean, I, I applied to a lot. I mean, I, I applied to five campuses. 
and four of them I applied for a PhD program and one of them was Masters of Engineering for Berkeley and I did not expect to get into Berkeley but that's what I got offered with and it's actually like it's number one in my priority <laughs> so it's like it worked well yeah, yeah really I was surprised that you did not expect you I don't know for my application maybe I was just too complacent that I only yeah. applied for two schools and I feel like yeah. uh, no I applied for three I got into two yeah but I was sort of confident so I don't know if it's just me I'm trying to build up my confidence back then that I'll get into Berkeley <laughs> and then I got in and I'm happy about that but that actually makes sense like you applied for PhD positions at Stanford and the other schools because that would give yeah. you funding yeah. so Stanford. what made you yeah. choose the option of applying for a master's in engineering at Berkeley is it because of the Picari scholarship or is there any other reason no I just so it's just me struggling with where I want to see myself in five to six years so I mean for me PhD is it's like it's it's a long it's a long program it's not that I want it. I, I definitely would want to be in a PhD program to do research. And I mean, a lot of people would start their career. It's a huge boost to your career to be in the PhD, um, to to be an expert, like to have the 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 to have created the the, the thing in the in the in the ecosystem for for that field. I mean, that's huge. But for me back then, I was just weighing the trade off between time and where I want to be. So yeah, it's 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 a lot of it's like three or four months reading Quora questions about <laughs> about people asking about should I take PhD, how, how's the PhD life, should I just take masters, what's the benefits, blah blah blah, all of those considerations. And after that, after those, after, I mean, after a while, I just decided that oh, I'm gonna apply for PhD and I'm I'm gonna apply to a few masters as well. I mean, I, originally I, I, I planned on applying for PhD and master's for Berkeley and see where it sticks. But luckily I didn't waste a hundred bucks more in applying for PhD. <laughs> yeah, and for Berkeley you can only apply for one program at a time. Oh, yeah, okay. so. Maybe that's why, yeah. Maybe that's how like, I was. And it's also yeah. the most expensive <laughs> fee, application yeah. fee. Now, back in the day it was 125 bucks now it's 140 so it's like wow. blowing up yeah well it's yeah. crazy and then yeah and then now that you got back then when you got to uh, decide okay i'm going to apply for graduate school and that how did you attack that application process basically yeah i mean for the application process i haven't thought about that but i would say I, it's just I mean, I have a, such a strong belief in myself that whatever I've gone through is enough to, to sell myself to for these people. So that's it. Like the way I attacked it is just, I was just being real. What drives me, what I want to achieve, what I see myself in and what, what I can offer you and what I can get from you. And yeah, that's in terms of essays, that's how I approached it. Like. A lot of people are trying to oversell themselves to beautify their resume or their story. But I guess for me, it's sort of like, if it's not for me, then it's not for me. And if, if, if it is, then they see the value in me and that's it. But in terms of the, the GRE and the collegiate, I mean, the exams, I actually took a lot of time trying to prepare for that. Like, I don't find shame in admitting that I did prepare for it because like you have to do and it's just stupid for you to to spend a lot of time and money and, and not focusing on something that actually is that you can plus also when I was talking to a lot of advisors I mean a lot of uh, People who've gone to PhD programs in the US here in the Philippines. So I went to UP and Ateneo. I was talking to people from MSE and uh, NIPS, like National, National, National Institute of Physics. And Sir Arnell from the National Institute of Physics told me that if you that you have to prepare for, for the exams, like you have to prepare for everything that's considered, because otherwise you're just, I mean, you're just driving off. 
place. Like you shouldn't expect to succeed if you plan, you haven't planned to succeed, something like yeah. that. So he told me like back in his days, uh, he, he, it took him like six months, like full time, six months to study for the GRE and the TOEFL programs. And he aced every, every segment of it. And that's how we got into uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which is, it's, wow. it's a huge, yeah, it's a huge uh, university for PhD in physics, especially back then. But he got that because of that, and 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 I I, I mean that I took that uh, full heartedly. I took I always have it in mind that this isn't an easy process. That there will be tens of thousands of applicants from all over the world trying to get your spot, and you have to prove that you're you're better than them. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful way of saying it. I really love. Like I got two main insights from that. <laughs> from Thank what you. you said one is that and, and that's something that I resonates with me I, I think I feel like I needed to hear that right now mm -hmm. when you're applying just give it your all and it if it's for you then it's for you if it's not maybe it's yeah. not maybe you're just not a good fit and it doesn't yeah. mean that you're not enough for that school maybe there is something better yeah. that's going to come uh, come your way later and the yeah, second point they, with Sorry, sorry. Yeah, and when the, and second point is what you said about the GRE and the TOEFL. There's no sh there's nothing to be, yeah. you know, scared of or shamed of for having to spend that much time because. Definitely, yeah. Ani diba? If you said I spent yeah, one true. month and I got one seventy, and and then, <laughs> what's your point? Because yeah. like. <laughs> going to graduate school is a grind like you will have to work a lot of time to yeah, succeed definitely so. yeah i mean it's also like i just wanted to point out that it's different for a lot of people i'm pretty sure a lot of grad grad school applicants would go online and like find the resources and just communities discussing about it and you will find people who would say i aced it without reviewing or like it was easy peasy or other people would be saying, I spent all year trying to review and this is what I got, blah, blah, blah. But it's it's different for everyone. And for you, you need to find what makes you feel more confident about taking the exam and what prepares you the best. It's, you, 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 it's hard to to get action points from different people because you definitely, you're, you're different from them. So yeah, it, it still goes back to knowing yourself and knowing what works for you, knowing where your limits are, where your weaknesses are, and just doing something about it. Yeah. And a friend recently told me about this. Like, from his perspective, the purpose of having the GRE in the grad school application is for those scores to demonstrate how much time you're willing to take in reviewing for a, such a time-sensitive yeah. test. And if you yeah. showed a high score in that exam, then it could demonstrate that you could grind through that process of you know reviewing for all these Definitely. exams and also that's an interesting insight uh, fortunately for this cycle for the fall 2021 cycle and i think it's becoming the norm now that people are not requiring gre anymore so yeah um, that's one thing i think it's a good thing in a practical perspective financial standpoint also yeah, yeah. that's true i mean i was i was gonna add that it's it's uh, GRE and TOEFL exams, they they actually, I mean, they make or break your application in that you have to qualify for a certain threshold. It's just, it's it's the school's way of sorting out who's, who's capable or who's not. But after you qualify for that threshold, it's really a matter of your own self, like who you are, what you want to achieve, and if, if it resonates with them, if it aligns with their mission as a university. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I know we're put, putting so much importance in this exam like for our, um, from our conversation, but I would say also that don't get too stressed about it. I mean, you did your best and and if you think it's enough, then it should be enough and just work on, on the other, other aspects of application. Yeah, and, and one thing after you completed all the applications is just waiting for decisions. And then once you finally hear back from those schools, um, back then, um, how did you find out that you got in to the program? Uh, this is, is funny. It, um, is it with an S? <laughs> sorry? Is it programs? <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I just... So I was... I think Berkeley was like the fourth 
the Berkeley decision was the fourth uh, letter that I got. So prior to that, I got rejected thrice already. <laughs> but it was it, I feel I felt shitty because to be to be honest, because I I I resigned from my work like six months before, um, before the school year would start because I was thinking that uh, I'm all set, you know, like uh, I just need to, to prepare myself. I need to spend time with my family and with my friends because in a few months time, I will be leaving. I mean, reality hit me when I started getting rejection letters, thinking that there's actually a chance that maybe you're not leaving, you know, you reside and you've been spending a lot of time with your family, but you're not leaving. But anyway, um, for the, the Berkeley story is that it's, it's pretty funny because uh, my family and I, we applied for a visa to Japan uh, because we're planning on going on a Japan trip. Like I said, we were, I was trying to spend most, um, in a lot of time with my family, bonding time because I expected soon to be leaving. But then we, we sort of, because we did it like a few weeks before the trip, which is a huge no-no, I would say. Like, yeah, like I said, in terms of preparation, in terms of doing your homework, you have to do it weeks before you don't you don't want to be rushing things so unfortunately the japan trip did not pull through because we weren't granted the visa <laughs> yeah because we rushed things we didn't show them enough collateral we didn't show our finances and all this stuff but so i learned that like a day before i got my berkeley letter so my Ooh. my berkeley admission letter was actually a huge relief and it it sort of it it made me feel better with the situation about Japan. So I was telling myself maybe the reason why I didn't go to Japan because I will be going to Berkeley soon. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's always like there's always a, a silver lining to all those things. But yeah, I learned about the decision a day after we found out that we got reject our visa got rejected, and obviously I was so happy about it um, um we were shouting at home my, i was celebrating with my friends and my family and also i i mean i had a, a girlfriend back then and it was it was a, a moment for us to <laughs> to just think let about. it sink in yeah think about our future <laughs> but yeah i mean <laughs> definitely i mean i'm pretty sure a lot of people can relate to that because you're in your you're in your point in life where you def some of you would have uh people who, who are tied with or who have a relationship with that that's a thing to consider as well when you're going abroad to pursue graduate studies is that there are relationships that can that sustain because you're close together and there are some that doesn't work out with, when you're long distance so you, you also have to consider that i could i could imagine the relief of getting that admission offer after the four rejections, the three universities. <laughs> oh, my God. oh my God. Yeah, I know. I was just, I was telling myself like 10 years from now, if I'm successful, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be printing all these rejection letters, putting it in a frame. And this is going to be my driving force to where I want to be. Like if I get rejected, all of the applications, if I get rejected, I'm going to be grinding all year, like all five years maybe just to prove them wrong just to tell myself that i'm worthy of an admissions letter but yeah. luckily i didn't go crazy on that because i got into berkeley yeah, <laughs> but yeah. finally and yeah. and having an admission offer is just the first step of another yeah. chapter of your life and this is a taboo topic sure. for many people but how did you fund your education I think you kind of pre-gamed a little bit with say by saying that you you've been chasing scholarships throughout. Yeah, that is true. Right? So. So, yeah, so it, it goes back to my trip to San Francisco actually when we visited Berkeley campus and I had a talk with the dean. So we I was asking them about how much how is the Filipino community represented? How about international students, Filipino international students, and how are they getting funded? How are they affording this? I mean, it's so serendipitous, but for me, very fortunate to have bumped into this professor because he told me about the Pickery Project. Like, I heard yeah. the Pickery Project from a dean in UC Berkeley. That's how I learned about it. He told me, uh, there are, we actually have some collaborations with the Philippine universities. It's called the Pickery Project. You should check it out. And then, so I wrote it down, and then I, I got home here in the Philippines. 
and then yeah, I, I, I looked at the Pickery project and luckily there are some professors involved in the Pickery um, that are in Ateneo de Manila. So I approached them. I did, I mean, I, I, I approached professors from Ateneo de Manila and University of the Philippines for the um, endorsement because you need an endorsement from a project leader to qualify for the, the, for the project uh, scholarship program. So yeah, that's how I learned about it. And I talked to my Ateneo de Manila University prof. Uh, we're actually quite close and he's a, he's a really good prof. Like he's very supportive of, of uh, students and divorce, uh, be it in tech or be it in science or academia or whatever. So he told me, I haven't, got, I haven't done any class with him, but he's just so accommodating with people that when you approach him, it's, it's Dr. Enriquez. By the way, Dr. Enrile Enriquez from the uh, material science department. But anyway, yeah, so he, he told me, yeah, sure. I mean, I think you're good enough for this. I think uh, you're capable of representing the country and you, I think we'll get a lot back from you. So, so yeah, he signed, he, he gave me his endorsement and the rest is history. And it was interesting preparing for that big move. I remember we were nervous about when will I get the funds I need to pay yeah. for my plane ticket oh my get god. an apartment yeah. and all that oh my god like getting an apartment is crazy because <laughs> I, I can't imagine how you've done it but the way we I did it was I just looked into Facebook social media talking to people looking at their listings and then I asked my auntie who lives in Sacramento that's two hour, two hours away from Berkeley to drive down to Berkeley to check the apartments and to video call me so that we can discuss about it in real time. It's, it's crazy how much technology can do, but also like, oh man, I mean, the fact that the Picari, I mean, the, the scholarship grant was a bit low, it's really nerve wracking. Like, oh my God, I got my life all set for this and come on, just push the papers and make this happen. I know. I got my U.S. visa two weeks before I leave oh the U.S. God, yeah, I remember when you reached out to me. What the hell? Because like, I did it. I did it like, I mean, for me, it was already pretty clutch. But your case was, it's like months more, months more delayed than I was. So yeah. I can't imagine how you, you pulled it, make it happen. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, for me, finding an apartment was... I, Peggy is really a uh, heaven sent for me. She took care of everything, signing the lease and all that. She had a credit score, so she signed her and oh, nice. Matt did the application, and then they added me as a third roommate later on, but I contributed to um, giving the deposit for the apartment, yeah. and we actually did not see the place until we got checked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, it worked out well because the apartment is really nice. And, you know, yeah, it was. It was nice. I mean, I've been there once, but it, it's nice. Like, I can't believe you landed that place compared to what, where I was living in. But, but you were paying much less than how much sure, I was yeah, paying. I was paying like 40% less. <laughs> yeah, that's what, you get when, that's what you get when you don't. I mean, you pay for, you, you, you get what you pay for. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was asking Aldrey a lot during that time. Like, is, is a thousand bucks too much for an apartment? And he would say like, it really depends on what you value. If you value a good place, then pay, go ahead and pay for that amount. But if you feel like that's too much for you, then you know you can splurge yeah. on something else. So it really Definitely. depends on yeah what we value as in our life. My mindset, my mindset then was just I needed a bed to be honest. Like I needed a bed to live on. Like, I wasn't planning on staying in my apartment for a lot of hours in my days because I was just. You know, I was just so pumped to get into Berkeley. I'm thinking I'm going to change the world. I'm going to build my career. I'm going to build my startup when I get there. I'm going to be working off hours till late nights. And yeah, but that's not what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, <laughs> you have to be human. You have to be human and you have to enjoy what's there, the friendship, the network, just the entire experience of it. I feel like it's kind of a, I feel like it's a guy thing. Aldrey also like, I just need a place to sleep and I was yeah. living in this place and I was fine. So yeah, w yeah, when you finally got there, how was it like, how was the Berkeley life like for you? Oh, I, well, to be honest, it's all good for me. Like 
this is a di- very difficult question to answer personally because I just easily adopt. I mean, when people ask me how's Berkeley, I would say it's not that different. Like it's the same with the Philippines. I mean, n- not not mu- nothing very cult- culture shocky for me, especially because it's Berkeley. It's actually very diverse. So you don't feel left alone. You don't feel out of place because a lot of people are out of place and you find solidarity in, in being out of place. So that's nice. There's like a huge community of immigrants as well. We're not English speaking. Uh, that's actually a huge thing for us Filipinos because like we speak English better than a lot of nationalities. It's a good thing and bad thing, but for this purpose, it's a good thing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest, um, difference is just the convenience of going around. Like transportation is very easy there. I mean, obviously it's a developed country. It's one of the leading cities in the world close to uh, being close to San Francisco. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice that it's convenient. You, uh, the transportation is not a hassle. Like you don't have to think about getting stuck in traffic or spending hours in EDSA just to go to your mm-hmm. office or wherever. Um, and just social, I mean, the, the infrastructure is, is what makes it different. To be honest, like being able to walk freely, the, what do you call this? Pedestrian lanes, the pedestrian walks are like twice as wide. So you can just, you know, you can just, walk uh, confidently comfortably and they respect pedestrian crossings as well even especially in the campus area like people would just cross without even looking at the road because drivers have the responsibility to respect the the pedestrian lanes uh in terms of the university it's that's what's crazy it took me a few months for this to sink in but i realized that Berkeley is where most of the technologies that change the world kept come from. I mean, aside from MIT, Stanford, but Berkeley is one of them. And, you know, you're just sitting in a lecture room without it, taking it for granted, but you have to realize that this is where Steve Wozniak would have seated. This is where the creator of Apple would have seated. This is where uh, Dado Banata or um, other people would have gone. Um, this is their entire experience. These are the profs that this one is Nobel laureate. This parking slot is for a Nobel laureate. And that's like <laughs> and a normal uh, thing for them. Like what? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's so easy. It's so easy to take it for granted. To be honest, it's so easy to take it for granted because you don't know where you're at. But if you if you re- once recognize that, you just wow, this is it's gonna overwhelm you. Like all this, all these classes uh, that are being held here. Like you can't believe that you're sitting in that seat, talking and listening to this prof who's changed the world, you know? So yeah, it's just, it's an awareness. It's, it's, it's good to have awareness for you to fully appreciate things, but it's not like without that awareness though, it's going to be hard for you to, to realize how it's different. Yeah, and I feel like even if you're not in Berkeley, if, if you're say in Atene or in UP, it's easy to take things for granted as well, feeling like, or whining about, oh, everything is so difficult, my exams, or, you know, I can't, perfect this exam or whatsoever but i feel like when you go out of that um comfort yeah. of that ecosystem you'll get to see okay th- that was a great environment yeah. you know like one of my impressions yeah, when i got sure, into, like... you know, one of my first imp- well, or one of my impressions when i was in berkeley was that realizing that filipinos are actually very intelligent people <laughs> like comparing it to we're, we're, we're what people in, right yeah. yeah and like we could keep up with what they're doing it's just that we lack those resources that they have yeah for sure i totally agree i mean it's not just i would say it's not just resources it's also the mindset but then again it goes back to being all set with other needs of your life right it's like the maslow pyramid anyway like once you've completely fulfill this aspect of your needs then you start thinking about other stuff and i mean that's the comfort that they have that's why they have different man- mindset and that's why they're solving problems that change the world because for us we're solving problems that are our problems alone so yeah but yeah to, going back to your point i realized that filipinos can do it for sure for sure like both of us are not even like 
we're not the, the we're not the prodigies that the the people think we are. I mean, I mean, obviously we're quite talented in our own fields. We 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 graduated from top universities here in the country, but still, like a lot of people would have would be a lot more deserving. And yeah, yeah resources and opportunities are they make it. Yeah, they it, make it, the dream it, happen. <laughs> it just reminded me of what. Uh, what you said earlier about um, appreciating the environment, like when when we were in Berkeley, having those kiwi kiwi bots running around the campus felt normal. Like yeah, that that when I got back to the Philippines, I'm like yeah, oh that's true. oh yeah, I forgot that delivery robots is not a common thing. <laughs> that is crazy yeah, to even talk about that. Like if you imagine it here, it's not just because of lack of technology but also because people would be robbing those robots for sure yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah i mean it's it's a it's there are a lot of factors to consider to be honest yeah and it's really not um, a comparison that yeah. we can easily make like com comparing us and the Philippines yeah. and that thing it's very yeah. different yeah yeah true but but what are your key takeaways from that experience now that you're back in the Philippines? What are you doing? Or like, how are you applying what you've learned and what yeah. you've seen? I mean, yeah, okay. So I think, I mean, we, we just discussed about how we can compare U.S. to the Philippines. But for me, really, my biggest takeaway, what I tell myself is that people change the world. People that change the world are humans. Still, they're just, humans that are more imag imaginative, humans that are more motivated, humans that see the bigger picture, humans that have the vision and the tenacity and the, the resolve to, to just pursue the, attack the problem, attack a problem and offer solutions. And for me, that's the biggest takeaway. Like coming from a developing country, you imagine huge companies like Yahoo, Google, Facebook or whatever to be very highly advanced like orders of magnitude more advanced like futuristic even but that's not it like you go to say san francisco you go to silicon valley and they hold the same computer that you hold i mean aside maybe from from supercomputers or quantum computers but like they type on the same macbook that you type they type codes on the same macbook that you type they sit on the same chair that you you sit on they drink espressos or coffees like you do so for me, that's my biggest takeaway. Like, I want to bring that passion to that that got inspired in me when I was there. I want to bring it home, and I want to show people that we can dream bigger. We can do something bigger. We can leave a mark in history as well. It like that changed the world. They're just made by humans that are, yeah, that are more motivated and more more ambitious. And that leads me to my next question of what are you doing now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so right now, um, I'm working with a friend, which you introduced, by the way. Shout out to uh, Niel, Niel Cancino. Uh, but we're working on a, an advanced manufacturing startup, startup idea. So right now, we're working on a core technology. So basically, I'm just at home. I'm working downstairs on the technology, tinkering with machines, with materials. Talking to people who met, who might be a possible stakeholder in this field, which, by the way, I'm quite struggling because um, when I reach out to people, they would say, tell me something that I already know, which is that the industry is not that established yet in advanced manufacturing, in composite manufacturing, robotics even which is inspiring because you know there's that problem. Like that's exactly why I'm doing this is for us to have an industry to talk about like, maybe a decade from now. So yeah, that's that's what, what I'm busy on. Um, just uh, watch, watch, watch out for this startup. It's called Morph Micro Factories. And we're gonna be creating uh, home-based manufacturing for everyone. I mean, for a lot of engineers here in the Philippines, local talents to use and to gain access from um, from mass, mass uh, to participate in mass production. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say something else, but I forgot. <laughs> very cool. well. I was gonna say very cool, and what a very witty name. <laughs> I 
I didn't realize that until you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh yeah, I was I was just gonna say I wanted. I mean, what really drove drove me to pursue this startup is also just I mean, learning about I mean, getting exposed to to the startup scene in Silicon Valley and learning about the technologies and the possibilities and telling myself that I can make this happen. We Filipinos can make it happen too. And I, that's why that's why we're doing it right now. Love that. Yeah. And it hopefully, my hope is that in the future, it would provide opportunities also for Filipinos to get into the field and maybe the next yeah, generation sure. of, maybe the next generation of engineers wouldn't <laughs> have to worry about going abroad, to, you know, get an experience for definitely yeah definitely Go, going back going back to your introduction i mean earlier when we were talking about your ee friends or ece friends asking you or some of your friends about what they would be doing after graduating if if, if it's even worth pursuing this hell of a course that they're taking right and and to be honest it's it's quite disheartening to learn that the roi the return of investment is not that satisfying if you just stay locally because there's not much industries to talk about and that's also one of the one of our main drivers is, is to change that to change that narrative to change that discussion that the philippines doesn't have this industry for mechanical engineers material engineers electrical engineers these are top engine top engineering courses that we offer that we're really good at and then we don't utilize them i mean that just boggles my mind like we just allow them to leave because there's nothing exciting here. That that's that's something that we want to change. Like, I, I to be honest, I just I want to see myself dealing with robots, creating parts, uh, creating new materials locally, uh, employing hundreds and thousands of people, engineering backgrounds, and asking them that I mean the Philippines is worth staying for. Like, more of micro factories. Is worth staying for here in the Philippines because we're we're doing something that change would change the world. And yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, I have nothing against the digital transformation, which is, which is a huge boost to our economy. But we also need a huge push from the other side, which is physical, the physical tech, physical sciences. We need to put more emphasis in that as well. Otherwise, we'll, we'll just be chasing the chasing the next big fad or next big. Uh, yeah, next big fad from the, a developing country, and we need yeah. to start our own. And we'll we'll always be ten years behind. I mean, the digital yeah. transformation started in the Bay Area what like ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and now we're just catching yeah. up. You know, I have nothing against people who are deciding to leave the country because I personally have thought about that as well. But when you think about what yeah, you can sure. do as well here, it's just a matter of who is willing to go through all that hassle of you know building the foundation of what you're envisioning this yeah. thing to be. So it's really a personal decision to like how much pain yeah. can you endure to go through all this, you know? Yeah, and it's not even like it's not even trying to compare your how much you love your country versus how much they love their country it's just like you said it's a personal thing like i'm i'm pretty sure a lot of these people that are living they love their country and they're hoping for a better philippines it's just they need more time they feel that they need more time they feel that they need more resources they feel that they need better skills or experience to implement the change that they want and it's nothing against them you know i mean as long as long as you you have like i said as long as you have the bigger picture um, as long as you know the, what the bigger picture is, why you're doing these things, why you're leaving the country, why you're doing like a lot of work for other people who's not even your country, man. But you should know, you should know why. You should always carry that why for, for why you're doing it. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Def definitely. Maybe to wrap up this conversation, what would you tell young Filipinos in engineering or in STEM in general who are looking to go to graduate school abroad or for those, even for those who are planning to stay in the Philippines? Uh, I would say, I mean, I, I think this, it, it, this is, it, it's quite a privileged statement, but I would say just do it. 
Like if you're afraid to apply, I mean, just do it. There's there's really nothing to lose aside you you lose some time, you lose some resources like money for applying, but you learn a lot as well. You, you, there's definitely a takeaway for everything that you do when you know you're pursuing your passion. So yeah, definitely just do it. That's 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 my biggest um, advice for everyone. Like don't think about what if I'm there, how would I make it work? It will work out. I mean, the fact that you got there, that you qualified for something tells you that even if there are other problems, you're going to make it happen. And if not, then for sure you're going to pick yourself up and look for something else. At least you tried, you know, like one of the main reasons why a lot of ideas or a lot of dreamers don't make the impact that they want to do in the world or that, that they want felt in the world is because it just stays being a dream. So for me, yeah, just do it. Like make it make it happen and um and yeah, and don't hesitate to reach out to people that you think can help or even if you don't think can help, they might be able to help. And there's a lot of opportunities that you don't know because you're not asking or because it's just you. I mean, we're just humans after all, like right. We don't know everything. Uh, there are other people who can help us with. So just just that. Just open yourself to, to these opportunities. That is it for this chat. If you like this episode or would like to suggest a future topic, let me know by sending me a quick message. I'm always looking for interesting conversations and hope to share more similar stories in the future. My Twitter handle is at Roxalt. That's R-O-X-S-A-L-T. You may also send me an email at rocksalt.acc at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in and see you in the next one.